Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for connecting on this monthly mentoring hour. Uh, this is a time that we take to interact, a time where we share uh, any questions that we may have um, or you know, some of the new learning uh, learnings that we have. Um, and uh, it, it's a wonderful time of discussion and uh, um, growing deeper uh, in the word of God. So before we get started for this uh, first mentoring hour for the semester let's uh, begin with a word of prayer um, uh, is it okay avni if i request you to lead us uh, in a word of prayer please good morning ma'am good morning everyone sure ma'am good morning let's pray let us pray father god we are so very thankful to you for a new day for your amazing grace, amazing presence, amazing promises that you've given us, Abba Father. We thank you that you have led us to this day, Father. We can glorify you for it is the, it is your will, Father, that we come together and worship you, Father, learn about you, know you more, and be deeply rooted in your word. And as we are, Lord Father, seeking you, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for all the teachers who put in hard work to teach us, Father. We bless them with your presence, with your knowledge and wisdom, Father, with your anointing. And we pray that each of them will be, Lord, equipped to teach us, Father, and that you would continue to lead each of them and bless them with good health and long life and, and with uh, your plans and purposes prevailing in each of our lives, Father. We thank you once again for what you are doing in us through your word. We thank you, Father, for leading us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have planned for us in future, Father. As we yield ourselves to you, Father, we give you all uh, authority and control over this meeting, Father, and lead us and help us to, Lord Father, seek you more. We bless your holy name for who you are and how you lead us. We give you glory, honor, and praise and ask this prayer in the most matchless, precious, and magnificent name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avni, for leading us in prayer. Uh, we will get started. So <clears throat> I would like to encourage uh, um, you know, uh, us to put forth our questions. If there is something that uh, you know, you've been wondering about, this is a good time to um, have that clarified. So please feel free. You can ask your question. You can either unmute um, your mic and ask, or you can uh, type the question in the chat. Our uh, APC Bible College faculty is here. So we will take up uh, your questions. So um, let's go ahead if there are any questions to begin with. I know that we've just uh, come through a, a wonderful season of Christmas and, uh, you know, uh, celebrating entering the new year uh, and also had a, a great time at the APC Christian Leaders Conference. So um, quite a bit of uh, learning there. Um, so uh, while we wait for questions, if there is something that you want to share about what you've learned, um, you're, you're welcome to do that as well. So. Anything from this uh, past season of the Christmas break? If you've learned something new, uh, please feel free. You can uh, share that as well. Uh, yes, Pastor, I have two questions. Yes, yes, Christopher, please go ahead. So uh, the first question is, um, just one minute. Yeah, so I just wanted to find out, um, you know, um, during the praise and worship um, uh, session, um, can the um, can the worship team and the, and the pastor, can they pray in tongues? um you know during the session um i'm just trying to understand um you know when you when we pray in tongues um 
uh, should it only be done in a in a you know in, in a congregation setting um you know when it is followed by an interpretation of what has been actually spoken in tongues so that is the first question you can just if you can just clarify that and the second one is um there are some um, denominations where that um, believe in, the, in in the apparitions of um, of mother mary for example and uh, this has happened over the years and you know these these have been these apparitions have then you know uh, been built uh, i mean shrines have been built on on these um, on the, on the place where these apparitions have actually happened so just want to understand uh, if you could just provide your view on these apparitions yeah those are the two questions okay uh, thank you, Christopher. Thank you for both of these questions. So the first question is, um, if uh, you know, the, during worship, during the worship session, the worship team and the pastor can pray in tongues, and if they do pray in tongues, then would that require um, an interpretation? Um, so uh, maybe I'll request Pastor uh, Jay Kumar to answer that question, if that's all right. And the second question is about um, uh, aberrations. I'm not too quite. Uh, I'm not very clear on on what that is christopher but i understand maybe some miracles isn't it some miracles that have taken place and shrines that have been built uh, in the places where these miracles took place no not just miracles they actually have have, have you know have indicated um, that there has been uh, you know um, uh, you know mary has actually appeared okay. uh, in that place yeah so it's like and that's that's where they are coming from yeah Sure. So one one of our faculty will answer that question as well. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for that. Uh, Pastor Jay Kumar, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Uh, thanks, Chris, for that question. Uh, to answer that question about the praying in tongues um, and even singing in tongues, so uh, we go back to one Corinthians fourteen, and uh, and you know there's a, a detailed explanation on how tongues should be employed, and definitely it's for personal edification. And um, so if you if you look at the end of the chapter, he says, uh, you know, let all things be done decently and in order. And verse thirty nine, um, do not forbid to speak with tongues. So we can, uh, you know, pray in tongues in an assembly, um, but the thing is we can speak it uh, between ourselves our pray in tongues between ourselves and the lord and not as a message to the church and if it's a message to the church then it has to be accompanied with um, with interpretation right so as a worship team um i mean the instruction uh, we give the worship team is just you step away from the mic and and sing in tongues you know not into the mic so that it's uh, loud and overpowering, but you just step away and sing in tongues. Um, because in a typical Sunday church setting, we have people who are believers, we have people who are uh, maybe understand uh, about tongues, and we do have others who are first time visitors, maybe who do not uh, have this understanding of tongues. So that also is there. Uh, but the, going by the biblical instruction um, that unless there is an interpretation, don't give it as a message. But you know, we can pray and sing between ourselves and the Lord. Um, but having said that, if there is a, you know, if it's like a gathering of believers and you know that it's like maybe leaders gathering together and uh, believers gathering together for, a, let's say, for an evening of intercession and worship and so on. So, so those are times when we can actually spend extended times as a corporate body, just praying out and singing out in tongues. Yeah, I hope that helps, Chris. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kumar, and thank you, Chris, for that question. So, Chris, we'll go over to your uh, second question here. Uh, I just wanted to know the uh, the exact question that uh, you have regarding this, the shrines. Uh, yeah, so um, there is this belief among the this, the, this denomination um, Primarily, I think it is a case, it is the Catholics who who believe that Mary has appeared, Mother Mary has appeared, um, and uh, you know they have um, uh, built shrines over there. So, in certain maybe in certain times of need or whatever, they have been, uh, and I think it's primarily in 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 Europe where she has appeared in different look in certain locations. They have actually seen her. Uh, that's what they say and um uh you know uh, they built a shrine over there so what they have 
you know felt that is you know the the that is actually sort of elevated uh, the position of Mary for them and you know that's how they you know uh, you know their their belief is a lot more and that's how they pray also to 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 Mother Mary. So, uh, but I think it's it's uh, my question is more about the you know. Uh, you know, will will would that be something that um, you know would happen? Uh, you know, based on uh, uh, you know what 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 are some of the principles or the guidelines of of, of the APC Church and uh, how uh, you know how do uh, what is the view of uh, okay. of, these, sure. of these actions? Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Chris. Uh, so uh, what you're saying is, what is our view about what you just described? So uh, yes. I'll leave this. Thank you. I'll leave this open. If uh, any of our faculty would like to address this matter, uh, please uh, feel free to step in. Uh, Christopher, uh, I'll just uh, like to share, you know, in response to this, uh, two things. One is what the Bible tells us. Uh, is in I just mentioned two places, Second um, Corinthians chapter eleven, uh, verses thirteen to fifteen. Second Corinthians eleven, thirteen to fifteen, and also in uh, Colossians chapter two, um, where he um, in Colossians two. Let me give you. Um, I think it's verse. Um, uh, verse uh, 18, Colossians 2, 18. So uh, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, Paul talks about Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. So the fact is that demonic powers can appear as divine beings appear so that's why it's called an apparition meaning it's not it's not it's not real it's like what appears so satan can appear as jesus christ right uh you know f f and their people like you know i've read um i read some time back long, i mean long back actually a book on the new age where um, uh, this person the author in his personal experience he used to have appearances of jesus to him but obviously it wasn't the Lord Jesus appearing, but it was demonic powers appearing like this person of light, appearing like Jesus and giving him messages and so on. You know, and so um, uh, uh, Paul warns us uh, about this, right? So whether it's an appearance of Jesus, appearance of some saint or Mary or, uh, you know, any divine being, we have to test everything, knowing that Satan himself can impersonate divine beings in um, in appearance, uh, in whatever spiritual experience that may be, whether in a, in a vision, a trance, or in a dream, uh, so, so on. So Paul, again, I quote another verse here, Paul says in Galatians 1, he says, you know, if in a, verse 8, even if, if, if we are an angel from heaven preach to you another gospel, you know, let him be a curse, Galatians 1, 8. So I'm looking at these three references, right? Second Corinthians 11, Colossians 2, 18, and Galatians 1, 8, where the Bible is warning us, just in, I'm just mentioning these and we can definitely look at a lot more scriptures, but the Bible warns us that demonic powers can appear as, you know, divine angelic beings, angels of light. They are impersonating the light you know they're they're pretending the light but they're actually spirits of darkness so when we have reports of people meeting jesus or meeting mary or peter or any of the saints or any of the angels everything has to be tested against scripture right so example if suppose somebody says you know uh, uh, apostle paul appeared to me and gave me this message. He gave me the missing gospels that he had actually written, and you know he gave it to me personally. And I have this personal copy of all the missing gospel uh, epistles that Paul had written. Okay, we have to test all of that, you know. So to answer your question, that's the position. That is, these appearances of any angelic being, whether these 
whatever, you know, like I said, it could be right from a being of the Trinity to an angelic being to a saint or, a, or a, everything has to be tested against scripture. How do we test them? Do they exalt Jesus Christ? Do they, are they in line with the truth revealed in the scriptures? Do they take, you know, do they draw us closer to the true and living God? You know, so we have to test these things. So in specific, and and, and, and you know, to go back to a specific example of uh, any kind of uh, apparition of Mary, I would question it because the Bible, nowhere does the Bible exalt Mary as a being to be worshipped, you know. So um, that is a big danger because Mary is not someone to be worshipped. You don't see it anywhere in Scripture. So that itself is a clear indicator that that's not of God when some spiritual experience elevates Mary to a place of and uh, to a place higher than what is shown or shared in Scripture. So, in a nutshell, we have to test all of these things. We have to keep in mind that demonic powers, spirits of darkness, can appear as any being of light. And so, we have to question and test everything. Hope that helps. Uh, yes, thank you, Pastor. Uh, I mean, so just to, uh, in a sense, confirm this also is that no, in the Bible, has there been any mention of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, any um, uh, heavenly being, uh, including Jesus or uh, Mary, uh, you know, coming, uh, you know, coming onto the earth, unless he's, unless uh, uh, the only one would probably be Jesus coming out on the, I mean, the second coming of Jesus. Is that correct? I mean, uh, in a sense that that would be also a confirmation that this is not not coming from God. Uh, well, actually, the Bible has you know, both the Old and the New Testament has instances of the Lord Jesus uh, uh, appearing to people, right? So, in the Old Testament, uh, we have God appearing to people. Uh, in those days, they they they, they saw it as an angelic being. So whether it's Abraham uh, having the experience of uh, the uh, you know uh, angelic beings coming to him, and usually this would be the capital A, because it's not very obvious that is it God or is it an angelic being. But then as you read the conversation, you'll find that it is God. So you'll have many people, you know, Abraham, Moses. Um, so, so many Old Testament people and, and the New Testament, Paul himself had encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ and so on. So does God really appear to man? Uh, yes, he does in visions uh, uh, that people have seen God or the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to them, both Old and New Testament. So God does appear and there are genuine visions, but we all have to be careful. And so everything has to be tested. And that's why even if somebody says, I've had a vision of Jesus Christ and I saw him with his nails pierced hands, that vision cannot be taken for granted. That vision has to be evaluated or tested in the light of, okay, what was stated? What was communicated? Who was glorified? Then we can say, yeah, that was truly from the Lord or that was a demonic power impersonating Jesus Christ. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor. And uh, thank you, Christopher, for uh, that question. Uh, we have uh, some more questions here on the chat section. Uh, I'll read it out. Uh, Herbert has he's asked us three uh, different questions. So we will answer them separately. And then, of course, uh, Jacqueline has uh, uh, another question that she has posted. Um, but before that, I just want to request uh, all our uh, participants, if uh, you don't mind, if you could please keep your uh, video um, uh, you know, off unless uh, you, you are speaking. That would be very helpful because I uh, noticed that some of the videos are on. Thank you so much for your understanding. Um, so coming back to Herbert's uh, first question here, uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> Praise God. Um, Satan and God, who, who, um, who is responsible for death? If it's Satan, why do people say that God has called the disease, deceased? So uh, we could address this question first and then move on to the other. So um, Herbert is asking, well, who's responsible for death? Uh, if it's 
Satan, why do people say that God has called the deceased? So that is his first question. Would like to request um, one of our faculty. Uh, I'll answer that, Pastor. Yes, Nancy. please. Yes, uh, please, Pastor. Thank Nancy. you. Thank you, Herbert, for your uh, uh, question. Uh, I'll answer the first part of that question. Uh, who is responsible for uh, uh, death? Uh, scripture clearly tells us when we read in uh, Genesis chapter 1 that, you know, when God created us, Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, uh, 26, let us make man in our image. So we were made in God's uh, likeness in his image, uh, which means that, you know, uh, God is uh, without sin. He created us without sin. God is holy, created us holy. God never dies. You know, uh, he uh, he's always eternal. He created us uh, in the same way. Uh, but if you also look at scripture, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin uh, is death. And uh, going back to uh, Genesis, uh, the garden, uh, God tells Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, that they must not eat from the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil, because if they eat of it, uh, they will surely um, die. And so that is, you know, what God uh, says, if they eat from that tree, they disobey, then, you know, uh, they will surely die. He's talking both about spiritual death and physical death, and that's how death comes into the world. Uh, other scriptures passages like i said is romans 6 uh, 23 for the wages of um, uh, sin is death and again paul in his epistle uh, to the church at rome in romans chapter 5 verse 12 says you know uh, uh, just as sin entered the world through one person uh, and death through sin uh, and thus death spread to all humanity because all sin so you know, and Romans 3, 23 also says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, but specifically in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, uh, you know, uh, just as through one person sin entered the world, that is, uh, you know, Paul is talking about Adam, just as through Adam sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread through all humanity because all sin. So uh, scripture is very clear about, uh, you know, um, that death is not from God. Uh, it is uh, because of um, uh, uh, what man did. He disobeyed God, sinned, uh, uh, fell short of the glory of God, and that is how uh, sin entered the world. Just answer that first part of the question. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Selina. Herbert, I hope uh, that uh, this addresses the question that you asked. Uh, yes, Pastor, uh, I, think, Nancy, I think we haven't answered the question. The question is, is did satan call the person home or did god call the person home mm -hmm. okay it's pasta yeah i uh sorry pastor nancy sorry pastor i i was i also said that i'll just answer the first part of that first question uh which is you know uh who's responsible for death so that's what i just answered. okay sure so we still have the second part there um so who calls uh, you know people home is it satan or God. So that part of the question is still remaining. Just want to uh, request one of our faculty to please address that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like what, what Pastor Selena explained. Yeah. So death came in and death wasn't part of God's plan. It is not God's intent for the human race. Uh, death came in because of sin. So um, to answer the question, like what Selena was saying, basically the, the direction that Selena was going was, first of all, death, uh, it's, it's the result of, it's man, the consequence of man's sin. So uh, we're not, we can't blame God or the devil. Uh, death came in, both spiritual and physical death came in because of man's own doing, right? So when a man dies, in general, right, overall we're saying that death of that individual is not God's work. It's not even directly Satan's work. It is the result of sin, as Pastor Selina was explaining. So we cannot blame God, neither do we blame the devil. But so having said that, and having that as the foundational understanding, 
we then begin to look at specific individual cases, right? So in individual cases, we, we have to look from that vantage point and having that basic understanding to see, okay, um, what what actually was the cause of death? Now, uh, in, in, in an, in, and, and there, there is no universal answer because every person's death is very subjective. For example, uh, if a person dies in an accident prematurely, I'm talking about, oh, let's say, a believer, example, a believer dies in an accident. We can't say God took that person. It's wrong to say God took that. No, maybe that person was driving rashly and you know did something, or somebody else was driving rashly and did something. So we can't blame God for that. We can't say God took that person or God called that person home. You know, that's wrong to say it. Underlying, we know, sin brought death, but in that case, it probably was somebody's mistake, you know, uh, which actually caused the death of that person. Uh, could Satan have been involved? Maybe. We can't always say that every accident is Satan's doing. It could be human error, human's responsibility. But can Satan cause situations to destroy people? Yes, we know. He can do that. An you know, example is in the in the book of Job, he caused all kinds of calamities, took away lives. And so we know Satan can do that. But we have to be discerning. So to answer uh, uh, and then in the case of people who live out the full course of life or who do whatever God's called them to do, they've completed what God's called them to do, and they live out their course of life, you know, then we can say, you know, that death, of course, it wasn't like there was not part of God's original intent for people to die, like we said earlier. But we can say that that person has completed their course and God has taken them home. You know, God, in that case, yeah, a person has lived out their full course of life. They have now transitioned in heaven. Uh, you know, we could say that. And that we could conclude those things from in the writings of Peter and Paul. Paul, for example, in Philippians 1 and 2 Corinthians 5, he expresses, you know, I, I'm ready to go home. 2 Timothy 4, I'm ready to go home. Peter also in uh, 1 Peter 1, he says, look, you know, I, I'm ready to put off this tent and I'm ready to go home. So in other words, these people, in their particular case, while they were writing, they're they are ready to transition. They've done their work. They're ready to transition, and it's more of okay, I'm going home, and God is taking me home. So to answer your question, uh, individual cases we have to look at it in a very subjective way. We cannot uh, give saying every person's death is God's work or every person's death is devil's work, or you know we can't say that. We have to look at individual cases, but. The foundation is God never intended man to die. It all happened because of sin, that understanding we have. And then we look at uh, it in an uh, in individual case. Have they led out their course, full course of love? Have they completed what God wants them to do? And so on. Um, that's how I would, uh, you know, I, I would interpret scriptures on, on death. And uh, yeah, is that okay, Herbert? Thank you, Pastor, for addressing the second part of that uh, question there. And uh, Herbert, I really hope that uh, it has answered your, uh, what you, uh, I mean, whatever you asked, that it has been addressed thoroughly. Uh, there are two more questions from Herbert. So uh, I'll go ahead with the next one. He asks, how can one develop the spirit of praying without ceasing? How can one develop the spirit of praying without ceasing? So um, we could take up this question next. How can one develop the spirit of praying without ceasing? OK, I think I'll just uh, add some, uh, share some thoughts here, and maybe others could add to it. So uh, as we see, uh, Herbert, uh, uh, scriptures do tell us, uh, do encourage us to pray without ceasing. And uh, now that 
you know, we have the Holy Spirit um, uh, both indwelling us and the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is available to the believer. Uh, we also know that, you know, um, God blesses us with this gift of praying in tongues. So uh, with that gift, you know, it is very much possible for us to uh, stay connected to God and uh, continually pray without ceasing, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know, uh, just as uh, uh, as believers, we can also pray from our hearts. Uh, and uh, this is a possibility now um, for us, especially because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So um, that is something that I, I wanted to share. Um, if there's anything more, I uh, would request others to kindly add, add to this. Yes. Uh, can I please add a thought? Yes, Pastor yes, Pastor Paul, please. Uh, thank you so much, Herbert. Uh, I just wanted to add what to what Pastor Nancy has mentioned. You know, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and so we can always be in this place of prayer. But uh, what I'd like to add is, so, so praying without ceasing, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, uh, what I believe he meant was, it's not like we have to, you know, just, quit our jobs or quit uh, everything that we're doing and just stay home and you know, just keep praying the whole day. But with the Holy Spirit inside us, we can uh, be doing our work, our nine to five jobs. We can uh, you know, be doing our chores, daily chores, driving. Uh, and every at every moment to be in that prayerful state or that, you know, that communion with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, and I, I believe that uh, you know, Paul is trying to communicate this. That, uh, we can pray without ceasing. Uh, of course, there are times when we have those dedicated prayers where we close our doors and lock ourselves in and uh, pray. But uh, praying without ceasing can also be um, at any moment, at any time, just uh, having that communion with God through the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul and uh, Herbert Hope. Uh, that helps. Okay, yeah. we'll uh, address Herbert's next question here. So this is about uh, the degree from APC. He says, if one has acquired a degree from APC, can he or she use it to do postgraduate courses, for example, in Africa? Um, so we we'll leave that open. Um, Herbert, um, it all depends on the um, um, the particular place where you're applying for postgraduate courses. So, generally, uh, APC Bible College is not. I mean, okay, let's just give you a background. APC Bible College is not accredited with any uh, other organization. Um, and just keep in mind that um, uh, accreditation of Christian degrees wherever it may be india or wherever else it's just a group of people have got together to say that yeah we are you know and they've established an entity that says yeah we approve of uh, this curriculum but it, 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 in most cases it's not a it's not a quote unquote government accreditation it's just an independent body providing that accreditation meaning a group of people got together and saying we we vouch for this curriculum you know because Christian college or Christian curriculum. It's not a government recognized. It is basically some body recognizing it. Um, now, APC Bible College is not accredited with any of those um, accrediting Christian accrediting bodies. But uh, what we feel is that just based on the quality of what we're doing and the nature of our courses, we want to be recognized. So, by all means, you can apply. Uh, to you know any postgraduate course uh, in, in in a college or university in Africa, you can reference our website and any letters that you need from us, we will provide so that they know that okay, this, these are the top courses you've covered. These are the many hours of work, uh, coursework you've completed, and then we leave it entirely to that institution to decide if they want to recognize this work or not. Now, uh, what, what if it is a Christian organization? You're going for a postgraduate course in a, you know, let's say a master's in divinity or a master's in theology. Mm, I'm sure that 
uh, there will be a number of courses that they will recognize. Courses what we have done, will they will recognize. Uh, depending on their theological position, they may or may not recognize other courses. So that you know that can vary from institution to institution. And uh, and uh, some institutions may require you to take a few additional courses. Uh, to uh, you know, depending on their program, so those are things we are aware of. Um, uh, but we will do our best to provide you with any letter or uh, information the college needs to verify the courses you've done. Right. So just keep in mind that this is not a government-run, you know, um, a government-recognized uh, program. So there will be that. That challenge is there. It's not a regular university that's recognized by a government organization. Uh, thank you, Pastor. And uh, Herbert, uh, really hope. OK, sure. So Herbert has responded on the chat. Uh, thank you, Herbert. Uh, we will now take up uh, Jackin's question. She says, dear Pastor, need some clarity on uh, uh, Pastor's book on refiner's fire, yielding and submission to God wholeheartedly is something I can understand and pursue with the Holy Spirit's help. And the purpose is for our own purification, removing the dross. My question here is, if I am put through trials many times again and again, is it that I have more dross? I mean, more rebellion within me, or is it my season time has not yet come? Please clarify. Thank you. So uh, that is Jackin's question while going through many trials. Is, is it because of the dross or rebellion uh, in us or that our, our season you know, ha has not yet come? So uh, I would like to request Pastor. Pastor, if you could please address. Yeah, so, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Jackin, I think, um, you know, let's say a person is going through you know, trials over and over again. There could be several factors to this, right? Uh, it's not that God wants us to stay in that, you know, a lifetime of trial. Uh, no, right? God, it's a, like, you know, God takes us through seasons or refining, purifying, and we go up. But it's not. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out lifetime of trial. That's not God's intent. Um, so when a person is repeatedly in this difficulty, a time of difficulty, we have to ask questions like, "Are they doing the right things? You know, to to grow up, to make progress." You know. So example. Let's take an example. So and and this has nothing to do with you. I don't know you personally, so um, don't take this example as personal. I'm just making up an example. So let's say a believer is in constant financial difficulty. Okay. And the believer says, "Okay, maybe this is my you know trial and purification." Quote unquote. God is trying to teach me. Well, maybe they are just they don't have financial discipline. Maybe they're just every month spending more than, than what they're earning. And so they're stuck in that situation. Uh, or maybe they have got themselves into huge debt and they don't have a proper plan to clear that debt and move forward in life. And so they're stuck in this financial situation where they have this huge debt. Um, they're having, you know, they're spending more than what they're earning. And therefore, month after month, they are in this quote unquote, time of trial and difficulty, and God has nothing to do with this. You know, the answer is, hey, you need some guidance on that person, needs some guidance on how to put their finances in place and come out of this as soon as possible. You know, that's the answer. But somebody can spiritualize an experience like this and say, oh, I'm going through a lifetime of trial, and that is wrong. You know, um, so uh, so what my my response would be: there there is a genuine work of God where He does refine us and purify us. And remember, the refining and purifying usually comes through the working of His Word, of His Spirit, and through people, and sometimes through circumstances. Right. Um, uh, so we shouldn't always take every 
difficult circumstance as God is purifying me. No, we need to look at some underlying things. You know, hey, how are you living life? Are you living right? Are you doing the things you're supposed to do responsibly? Right? And we shouldn't spiritualize our failures and call it as, you know, God purifying us and so on. So uh, uh, to answer your question, there are numerous factors involved. Uh, we need to look at all of these things objectively, you know, uh, 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 and and to say you know, and to sum to just make it very brief. Um, normally speak, the way God normally works is there are seasons of trial, and these seasons are not lifetimes of trial. It's it's a period of maybe if a month, few another month, a few months, maybe a year, whatever. You know, it's not like a long drawn out process, and. And and the key to coming out of the tri that season of learned trial is really you learn what God wants you to learn. So gun, you're basically you're graduating, right? It's like us writing exams to move to the next le next class, uh, next grade. It's not like a long drawn out thing. You pass the exam, you move to the next grade, you move to the next level. So we need to look at you know look at things like that, and uh, we should be careful not to spiritualize too much. Uh, look at everything very objectively. Uh, see where we need to get counsel and wisdom, because wisdom will help us come out of many of these situations that we think are trials, but really they are our own doing in our own lives. I uh, I hope I didn't confuse you. I hope that answered. Please feel free to ask any follow-up question. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yes, uh, Jacqueline has message saying, sure, Pastor, thank you so much. So I think her, uh, she has received clarity from what you explained. Uh, we'll move on to Sam's uh, questions here. So he has two questions. Uh, the first one uh, that he asks is, uh, could you share any thoughts on sola scriptura, the idea that we must go only by the word of God? So the word alone, uh, that's sola scriptura, uh, versus uh, we need to consider traditions, guidance, and counsel of the godly, etc. So, you know, um, how how do how do we uh, make decisions? Um, you know, in general, that's what uh, Sam wants to know. Is it solely uh, by uh, scripture, or uh, is there a place for other things like traditions, guidance, uh, and counsel of the godly? Uh, Deepika, would would you be able to address this question, please? Uh, it depends, Sam, on um, the focus of your question. If you're, you know, speaking about sola scriptura in terms of uh, um, the way it was used by, uh, you know, Martin Luther um, at that time, he was uh, basically saying that a officially appointed governing body is right now deciding what people should do and not do when it comes to spiritual matters so he said if what they are saying what that officially appointed governing body is saying uh, is not in line with scripture then scripture should be considered uh, as the uh, you know ultimate authority in deciding uh, you know the conduct and matters of salvation and doctrine and all of that so um, at that time, when he used the term sola scriptura, all he was saying is, let uh, the scriptures be the final authority. The governing body should not be the final authority on determining matters of doctrine and conduct and all of that. So he was saying that uh, um, scripture is supreme. Uh, scripture is sufficient in uh, tackling you know the main issues of uh, spiritual life uh, you know answering questions regarding spiritual life and uh, scripture is clear enough uh, to uh, to interpret one portion of scripture is able to interpret another portion of scripture so in that sense uh, we must look to scripture and if what people are saying does not line up with scripture scripture should be accepted not just the rulings of a government uh, body because the government body may sometimes you know work for its own benefits it may not always have the good of the people at heart in case the people you know leaders of that governing body have become corrupted so it's always good to have uh, scripture as the final authority in determining different uh, matters regarding our faith um, but does that mean that we uh, don't even go 
for for godly counsel to people to spiritual leaders no i don't think you know um, uh, martin luther was even thinking of that uh, because after all we have so many scriptures in the bible which talk about the importance of godly counsel um, just to take one proverbs 11:14 says that uh, when there is no guidance the people fall but in the abundance of counselors there is victory so godly counsel is a good thing and i don't think uh, sola scriptura concept is is um, you know cancelling out godly counsel in any way we can always go to leaders for godly counsel but of course uh, once we receive the counsel from them we come back to the scriptures and say see whether what they are saying is lining up or not uh, with what uh, you know um, the scripture itself is saying so um, yeah uh, Sola Scriptura the, um, it does not cancel out uh, godly counsel. We can, yes, definitely continue to go to leaders for godly counsel. Thank I hope you. that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Deepika and uh, Sam. I hope that's okay. Could I just um, add a follow up question, Pastor Nancy? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Deepika. Um, uh, Nancy, could I just follow up a little bit? Uh, yes, you could. You could. We have two more questions to go. So we'll see if we can accommodate them in this call because we have just about five minutes left. So we'll have to be very brief. All right. Um, also, I realize that I think this, there's so much on this um, that I, mean, I don't, I'm, I'm, so I think part of this is my learning journey and I'm not in a rush also. But just uh, to the first part of Fasa Deepika that, you know, um, that we don't rely on a governing body, but we rely on the scriptures as the final authority to, to guide us. Uh, so in that, um, so I think a little bit of struggle is um, the way the scripture is interpreted by the final governing body. So so I, I don't have any particular, but just probably just one or another topic of dissension which is um salvation can can you know can a person lose his or her salvation versus once saved is you know safe for it and so 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 script so you know there is there there are you know some um some different like different governing bodies interpret that differently and i think that's what results also in denominations so if i go to one denomination uh and with 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 scriptures um the way that scripture is interpreted by that denomination is slightly different if i go to another denomination so i think that is also another part which i am like a little bit struggling in in terms of looking at scripture alone as as guiding um and guiding a believer's life Thank okay. you. Uh, so, Sam, thank you. Thank you, Sam, for sharing that. Uh, uh, I would uh, encourage you to maybe, you know, um, uh, one of one of the, the faculty, maybe you could just uh, reach out to them because it uh, seems like you have, uh, you know, you want to clarify other things uh, uh, in line with the question that you asked. So it might be helpful to do it personally is, is what I would uh, say. And also, you know, because of the paucity of time. And I really hope uh, that's all right with you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, so Sam has uh, another question here and Divya as well. We have only two minutes left. So um, uh, would it be all right if we take this up in the next uh, uh, mentoring hour? Everyone? Sure, sure, Pastor Nancy. I'm fine. OK. All right. So I made a note of uh, the questions here. We will pray and uh, we will wrap up for uh, today. Uh, just want to request uh, maybe John Paul. John, could you please lead us in a word of prayer? Okay, no worries. I uh, think uh, I'll just pray. Let's let's pray and close. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the different questions, Lord, that uh, were asked. And Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you are, uh, Lord, um, 
giving us revelation, enlightenment, Father God, and Father, deep understanding so that we can strengthen our walk with you. Father, uh, we pr pray that you'll continue to lead us in this way, God, that uh, we will be able to learn many uh, things about you. And God, that uh, uh, we through all of this, Lord, that we will be a blessing, Father God, to uh, you and the kingdom, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity. Pray your blessing upon all the students and all the faculty, Father God. Father, we commit the rest of the day and all the classes ahead into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, connecting on the call. And thank you, uh, our faculty, for answering the questions. Uh, have a wonderful day. We made a note of the questions that were not addressed. We will uh, answer them later. Thank you. God bless you. Bye for now.